Wild Young Online presents Young Tales, tales for the young and the young at heart. Today's story, Bullfinch's Mythology, Stories of Gods and Heroes, Apollo and Daphne. The slime with which the earth was covered by the waters of the flood produced an excessive fertility which called forth every variety of production, both good and bad. Among the rest, Python, an enormous serpent, crept forth, the terror of the people, and lurked in the caves of Mount Parnassus. Apollo slew him with his arrows, weapons which he had not before used against any but feeble animals, hares, wild goats, and such game. In commemoration of this illustrious conquest, he instituted the Pythian Games, in which the victor in feats of strength, swiftness of foot, or in the chariot race was crowned with a wreath of beech leaves, for the laurel was not yet adopted by Apollo as his own tree. The famous statue of Apollo called the Belvedere represents the god after this victory over the serpent Python. To this, Byron alludes in his Child Herald, verse 4, 161, The Lord of the unerring bow, the god of life and poetry and light, the sun in human limbs arrayed, and brow all radiant from his triumph in the fight, the shaft has just been shot, the arrow bright, with an immortal's vengeance in his eye and nostril, beautiful disdain and might and majesty flash their full lightnings by developing in that one glance the deity. That leads us into the story of Apollo and Daphne. Daphne was Apollo's first love. It was not brought about by accident, but by the malice of Cupid. Apollo saw the boy playing with his bow and arrows, and being himself elated with his recent victory over Python, he said to him, What have you to do with warlike weapons, saucy boy? Leave them for hands worthy of them. Behold the conquest I have won by means of them over the vast serpent who stretched his poisonous body over acres of the plain. Be content with your torch, child, and kindle up your flames, as you call them, where you will, but presume not to meddle with my weapons. Venus's boy heard these words and rejoined, Your arrows may strike all things else, Apollo, but mine shall strike you. So saying, he took his stand on a rock of Parnassus and drew from his quiver two arrows of different workmanship, one to excite love and the other to repel it. The former was of gold and sharp pointed, the latter blunt and tipped with lead. With the leaden shaft, he struck the nymph Daphne, the daughter of the river god Peneus, and with the golden one Apollo through the heart. Forthwith the god was seized with love for the maiden, and she abhorred the thought of loving. Her delight was in woodland sports and in the spoils of the chase. Many lovers sought her, but she spurned them all, ranging the woods and taking no thought of Cupid nor of Hymen. Her father often said to her, Daughter, you owe me a son-in-law. You owe me grandchildren. She, hating the thought of marriage as a crime, with her beautiful face tinged all over with blushes, threw arms around her father's neck and said, Dearest father, grant me this favor, that I may always remain unmarried like Diana. He consented, but at the same time said, Your own face will forbid it. Apollo loved her and longed to obtain her, and he who gives oracles to all the world was not wise enough to look into his own fortunes. He saw her hair flung loose over her shoulders and said, If so charming in disorder, what would it be if arranged? He saw her eyes bright as stars, he saw her lips, and was not satisfied with only seeing them. He admired her hands and arms naked to the shoulder, and whatever was hidden from view he imagined more beautiful still. He followed her, she fled, swifter than the wind, and delayed not a moment at his entreaties. Stay! said he, daughter of Peneus, I am not a foe. Do not fly me as a lamb flies the wolf or a dove the hawk. It is for love I pursue you. You make me miserable for fear you should fall and hurt yourself on these stones, and I should be the cause. Pray run slower, and I will follow slower. I am no clown, no rude peasant. Jupiter is my father, and I am lord of Delphos and Tenidos, and know all things present and future. I am the god of song and the lyre. My arrows fly true to the mark, but, alas, an arrow more fatal than mine has pierced my heart. I am the god of medicine and know the virtues of all healing plants. Alas, I suffer a malady that no balm can cure. 
The nymph continued her flight and left his plea half uttered. And even as she fled, she charmed him. The wind blew her garments and her unbound hair streamed loose behind her. The god grew impatient to find his wooings thrown away and, sped by Cupid, gained upon her in the race. It was like a hound pursuing a hare with open jaws ready to seize while the feebler animal darts forward, slipping from the very grasp. So flew the god and the virgin, he on the wings of love and she on those of fear. The pursuer is the more rapid, however, and gains upon her, and his panting breath blows upon her hair. Her strength begins to fail, and, ready to sink, she calls upon her father, the river god. Help me, Peneus! Open the earth to enclose me or change my form, which has brought me into this danger. Scarcely had she spoken when a stiffness seized all her limbs. Her bosom began to be enclosed in a tender bark. Her hair became leaves. Her arms became branches. Her foot stuck fast in the ground as a root. Her face became a treetop, retaining nothing of its former self but its beauty. Apollo stood amazed. He touched the stem and felt the flesh tremble under the new bark. He embraced the branches and lavished kisses on the wood. The branches shrank from his lips. Since you cannot be my wife, said he, you shall assuredly be my tree. I will wear you for my crown. I will decorate you with my harp and my quiver. And when the great Roman conquerors lead up the triumphal pomp to the capital, you shall be woven into wreaths for their brows. And, as eternal youth is mine, you shall also be always green, and your leaf no, no decay. The nymph, now changed into a laurel tree, bowed its head in grateful acknowledgement. That Apollo should be both god of music and poetry will not appear strange, but that medicine should also be assigned to his province may. The poet Armstrong, himself a physician, thus accounts for it. Music exalts each joy, allays each grief, expels diseases, softens every pain. And hence the wise of ancient days adored one power of physic, melody, and song. The story of Apollo and Daphne is often alluded to by the poets. Waller applies it to the case of one whose amatory verses, though they did not soften the heart of his mistress, yet won for the poet widespread fame. Yet... What he sung in his immortal strain, through unsuccessful, was not sung in vain. All but the nymph that should redress his wrong, attend his passion and approve his song. Like Phoebus thus, acquiring unsought praise, he caught at love and filled his arms with bays. The following stanza from Shelley's Adonais alludes to Byron's early quarrel with the reviewers. The herded wolves bold only to pursue... The obscene ravens clamorous over the dead, the vultures to the conqueror's banner true, who feed where desolation first is fed, and whose wings reign contagion, how they fled, when, like Apollo from his golden bow, the Pythian of the age one arrow sped, and smiled, the spoilers tempt no second blow. They fawn on the proud feet that spurn them as they go. And here we end. Young Tales is produced and narrated by Todd Young from Todd Young Online. If you enjoyed this, please like and subscribe and join us next time for another story. Thank you for your support.